You know, since we're on the topic of families, my daughter is giving birth right now, so I get to, I get to add that. But, uh, and, and I get to be here with you. <laughs> uh, no, she and her husband are together here in Waukesha, and so that's a good thing. Um, last week, I talked about marriage, and last week, I talked in talking about marriage, about how God created us differently about how God created us to be equal but yet opposite, to really complement each other, and the differences are good things. I I talked last week about how the wife is presented to Adam, and she is a gift from God, and how husbands, if you're married, your your wife is a gift from God. And if you will be married, understand that, that that's who she is. She is a gift from God. And then I talked about how God intends for us to live just completely vulnerable and transparently with each other. This is God's plan. Now, today I want to talk about how we pull all that off, because that's a tall order. You know, how do we get there? How do we make this happen? And I'm going to be looking at a passage in Ephesians 5 today that is somewhat of a controversial passage, but so what I want to ask you to do is to kind of dispel preconceptions you might have before we get into it, uh, and really come into it and say, okay, what is Scripture telling us? What is it that we learn about husbands and wives from this passage? About two decades ago, I, I'm in my mid-twenties, and here I am pastoring in a denomination that has taken a whole lot of moves away from the Bible, and I became known as the pastor that believed the Bible. And so, on one occasion, I got a phone call from a women's group, and and they prided themselves in being kind of a, a radical feminist group, and they were reading through Ephesians 5, and they were very angry. And they called me and said, would you come and, from your perspective, explain Ephesians 5? And I, like a dummy, said, sure. And so I, I did. I, I showed up, and, and here I am, and, and I've got all these ladies that are at least 20, 30 years older than me, several of them with PhDs. I, I'm very intimidated, and I'm sitting there, and I'm looking at my notes, and I'm not looking up, and I'm going through a lot of what I'm about to go through with you, and halfway through it, I look up, and I notice half of them weeping. And so I stopped, and I kid you not, I stopped, and I said, what, what's going on? And they said, that's what we've hungered for. That's what we've needed. This is describing what we're lacking. And and it just, it hit me. You know, as we get into Scripture, God says, I've got a plan for your marriages to thrive. Uh, And and understand that that is my desire, God says. Uh, And and it happens, and here's the point, It, it happens when you and I start treating each other as Christ treats us. And really, this is the foundation. Here's the point. Here's what we'll keep coming back to as we get into Ephesians 5. Now, in Ephesians 5, if you've got a Bible, turn with me. I'm going to go from verses, well, I'm going to kind of jump around a little bit, but I'm going to cover from verse 18 to 32, and primarily in between verses. So kind of open up with me. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in your rows. If you don't own a Bible, take the one in your row, make it yours, bring it back every week. And what we will do here at Elmbrook is go through the Bible together. So as we get into Ephesians 5, this particular passage, there are four truths I want to highlight for you, four truths that will help our marriages thrive, four truths that we need to understand and digest Put away preconceptions and understand what God is saying here. So if you're married especially, if you plan on being married at some point, you need this. Let's take notes on this. Point number one is this. Husbands, love and serve like Jesus. Uh, Interestingly enough, in these surveys that came in, 200 surveys that men turned in, well over, I think, 900 or so surveys that women turned in, and, and, and overwhelmingly, the biggest thing that ladies said, wives said, I wish my husband took a spiritual lead or loved me as Christ loved or was, was, was more spiritual in the sense of growing in his relationship with Christ. I mean, this was the number one bar none answer throughout the entire survey. And so here is what God says to husbands. Husbands, listen to this out of verse 25, Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives just as, notice those words, just as, just as Christ loved the church 
and gave himself up for her. Now, n- notice what this is saying. Husbands, here's what you're called to do. Love like Jesus. How did Jesus love? Well, he gave himself up for us. Who is the church? All of us who have trusted our lives to Christ, receiving his forgiveness and receiving the life that he came to give. We make up the church. How does Jesus love us? Let me give you some really practical answers to that. He puts his needs before, he puts our needs before his own. And that's how Jesus loved us. He is never critical, he is never overbearing, and he is never abusive. Go through Scripture, and you don't see Jesus doing that with his followers, with his church. He, is, he never forced his own way, and he still never forces his own way. He is a constant companion. He empowers us through his Spirit. He promises to never leave us. He is the first to bring grace and to our relationships. He is the first to forgive. He never gives up on us. He gives up his rights for us. Philippians 2, he dies for us. Here is how Jesus loves the church. And notice what it's saying to husbands. Love your wife like that. And, and it's not a power thing. A lot of us say, okay, this is a power thing, okay? Uh, it's not. It's an empowerment thing. Husbands, we need to ask ourselves, uh, are we empowering our wife to be everything God intends her to be? Uh, Are we loving her in this way, even to where we will sacrifice for her and take a bullet for her if needed? Uh, Are we loving in that way? Uh, are Are we truly loving as Jesus loved the church? I mean, that's the question that we're forced to ask ourselves. Verse 26, it goes on to say this. Uh, It says, husband, love your wives in this way to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Notice the words cleansing and washing. I mean, this isn't saying, husbands, that you cleanse and wash your wife This is God does that through forgiveness. God does that through his grace. What this is talking about literally is husbands set the pace of grace in your home. Be the first to bring grace in your home. Be the first to forgive. If you're at an impasse and you're in an argument, be the first to reconcile. Be the first to give. Be the first to forgive. Why? Because Jesus was the first. Jesus was the first in all of these things. Be first as Jesus was first in bringing grace into the situation, into the marriage, into the relationship. And and it goes on to, to really explain this with regard to grace. You see, grace makes us alive. Grace makes us radiant as Jesus, through his grace, made the church alive and made the church radiant. Grace makes us joyful. So husbands, we need to ask ourselves this question as we are in this passage. Is your wife more alive today, more radiant today, more joyful today as a result of being married to you? I mean, that's the question we need to ask, and that's a hard question. You know, grace empowers us. Is your wife today more empowered to be everything God intends her to be because she is married to you? I mean, these are the questions, husbands, that we have to ask ourselves as we get into this passage. I mean, it's a tall order. I mean, we have to ask some really deep, serious questions in this. I have to ask myself these questions in this. Number two, second truth that we see here in this passage is this. So husbands love and serve like Jesus. Wives support him in this. Verse 22, back up with me. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is Savior. Some of us might listen to those words and bristle. That small group 20 years ago that asked me to come and teach on Ephesians, they, uh, I think some of them hadn't read Scripture before. They got into Ephesians, read that, and were furious. What does that mean? Well, how did Jesus become the head of the church? Here's how he became the head of the church. Literally, out of love, he made himself nothing. Out of love, he submitted himself to to brutality, even to death on the cross. Philippians 2, and as a result of that, the Father exalted him above all other things. 
I mean, it wasn't a power thing. It wasn't a power play. It's not an issue of top-down hierarchical kind of thinking as we get into this. Verse 24, now as the church submits to Christ, so also the wives should submit to their husbands and everything. Okay, let me talk about what submit doesn't mean. If you're taking notes, submit doesn't mean, let me give you four things. Number one, submit, biblically speaking, does not mean obey. Notice in, in Ephesians here, it says, children obey your parents, wives submit, husbands love, just as Christ loved the church. I think the tallest order, quite frankly, is on the husbands, but notice this. Children obey, wives submit. How many of you, get honest, ladies, how many of you in your marital vows uh, spoke or, or said, I will obey my husband in your marital vows? For a show of hands. Uh, it's, it's interesting. I, I don't do it in the vows when I do weddings. Because literally, it's not in Scripture here. It's not in Ephesians. Ephesians, it says, children obey, wives submit in this way. It doesn't talk about this as being obedient. So submit doesn't mean obey. Secondly, submit doesn't mean to be controlled. Go back to verse 21. Notice what it says. It says, submit yourselves, therefore, to everyone out of reverence to Christ. It's talking about us within the church. It's talking to me. It's saying, Philip, as senior pastor, submit yourself to everyone else. And it's saying to you, submit yourself to me and to everyone else out of reverence to Christ. Submission is something that we all do so that we might not dominate each other, so that ultimately we might let God dominate and control the circumstance and control the situation. It's an attitude, in this case, of flexibility. It's an attitude of openness. It's an attitude of respect. It doesn't mean be controlled. Thirdly, to submit doesn't mean that the wife is less than the man. Jesus submitted himself to the will of the Father. Is Jesus less than the Father? Absolutely not. If you start building a theology saying that Jesus is less than the Father, you end up with Jehovah's Witness or Mormonism or some other doctrine like that. I mean, Jesus says, the Father and I are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And, and there's not a, a lesser than, but yet he submitted to the Father, but yet, the, the, yet they are equal. They are, the, they are in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus submitted himself to humanity as he came to us, but is Jesus less than humanity? Absolutely not. He created us. But yet he submitted to us and submitted even to death on the cross is what we're being told. So submit doesn't mean that the wife is less than the man. And fourthly, submit doesn't mean be overpowered. Now, in a marriage, you cannot possibly have intimacy if there is a power imbalance. A lot of marriages are, you know, kind of have a parent-child relationship, either with the wife or the husband as the parent, and there's a power imbalance, and there's nothing that kills intimacy quicker than a parent child relationship in a marriage, a, parent, a, a power imbalance where someone is dominating the other person, whether it's the husband or the wife. I mean, it just doesn't happen. I mean, we need to see ourselves as equals and approach the situation as such, and, and that's what God is calling us to do. Now, I'm cautious with this verse because I've personally seen it so misused and abused. In my own office over the past 20 years, there have been three occasions that I can recall where I've had couples in there with the, with the husband literally shaking his finger at the wife saying, you must submit, looking to me to basically support him in this and, and, and gets upset when I don't, and I tell him that I think he's bullying. And, and that's not what Scripture says. This isn't what Scripture is saying with regard to submit. So what does submit literally mean? It means a voluntary attitude of cooperation. A refusal to dominate whether the other person, the event, the agenda, the outcome. Why? Because this is what we need God to do. To dominate in our relationship, in our life, to empower us. You know, when it comes right down to it, the disciples got all power hungry and position hungry at one point, And they start arguing about which one of them is the greatest. They start arguing about, well, we want thrones beside you, Jesus, one on our right, one on your right, and one on your left, and let the other disciples fend for themselves. They want position. They want power. Jesus says, you know what? You guys are thinking just like the Gentiles in the world does. You know, just like the Roman army does. Org charts and hierarchy and top-down and lording power over others. He says, that's not the way it's to be with you. 
Literally, Jesus says, not so with you. Not so with you as you follow me. This is not going to be what you aspire to. As a matter of fact, if you want to be the greatest, if you want to be the first, you must be the least, the last, the servant of all. That's what he says. So when we look at power, Jesus says, I want to redefine it. When we look at position, Jesus says, I want to redefine it. I want you to have this kind of relationship with each other that's motivated by love, that's motivated by this this mutual kind of respect that I want you to have. Number three, husbands, be intentional about caring for your marriage. Verse 28, listen to this. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Get this real quick. Okay, how do we love our own body? Well, it's not talking about self-love. It's talking about just basically self-preservation. You know, we, we clean our own bodies. We shower every day, hopefully. We, we, we wash the dirt off of ourselves. We certainly feed our own bodies. I know I haven't missed many meals. And, and so in, in the same way, listen to this. Husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. Literally, we don't stop grooming our body, we don't stop bathing, we don't stop feeding, and just as Jesus takes care of us, it's saying, husbands, lead the way in this. Be intentional, and if you're a husband, write down the word intentional by this. Be intentional about caring for your marriage. You see, a lot of marriages could turn around overnight with just a little bit of attention, just a little bit of intentionality, a little bit of care. I mean, that's what Jesus is saying. Do this, apply this. Husbands lead by bringing this care and this intentionality and this love in the situation. Be first. Why? Because Jesus was first. In a lot of the surveys, listen to this, uh, a lot of the women were saying the things that you saw up on the screen. But here are some individual responses that wives gave. Uh, One wife said, I wish my husband knew how lonely I am. Another wife said, I wish my husband knew how desperately I need affection and acceptance from him. I haven't gotten a you're beautiful from him in almost 20 years of marriage. Another wife said, I wish my husband knew how much pain and damage he causes. Another, I wish my husband knew how much it hurts me when his eyes wander onto other women. Another, I wish my husband knew how to love me passionately and tenderly and show it emotionally. Another, I wish my husband knew that when he withdraws, it makes me feel like I'm optional. Another, I wish my husband knew how much it hurts me when he's affectionate only when he wants things to go farther. Another, I wish my husband knew that raising his voice to me doesn't make me listen to him better. So how do we feed and care for and clean and bathe our marriage? I just want to give you three, three points on this. So if, if you're taking notes, three things that we need to be doing. Uh, and, and let me just say this, and it's not just the husband's responsibility. We both need to be involved in this, although the husband is being told, be intentional about this. Don't let this slide, guys, because I think we will let things like this slide. Number one, make sure that we feed our marriage with affection and attention. So last week I read one submission from a husband, a guy who said, I wish my wife knew how much I love her and care for her, even though I rarely show it. Okay, get this. A lot of us husbands, we have this understanding that I told you I loved you once. If I change my mind, I'll let you know. (laughs) You know, and and I'll I'll let you know. I haven't changed my mind, you know, And, and so, you know, that doesn't do it. God says, I want you to be intentional about affection, and attention. I want you to go out of your way to be intentional about this. Why is the husband told to do it? Because I think it's a little harder for the husband. I, I, I think it doesn't come as a natural thing for us. We need to go out of our way on this. We're being told to make sure that we feed and care for our marriage. You know, we are being told that we can do better than just, well, you know, I told you once. I'll tell you if I change my mind. Number two, how do we get intentional about caring for our marriages, we make sure that we wash away the dirt of resentments 
by living and modeling forgiveness. You know, a lot of us, wow, we can let resentments go, and, and, and it can begin with a speck, and then it grows into a, a, a rock, and then it grows into a boulder, and pretty much then there's a chasm between us. You know, I, 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 I've actually met with people who haven't been intimate in their marriage for decades because of resentments that they've let settle in. And they've not dealt with them. And as a result, that they're just like less than roommates in some cases. You know, husbands, make sure that you clean your marriage by making sure that resentments, the dirt of resentments, doesn't stick to your relationship. Be the first to forgive. Be the first to reconcile. Be the first to bring grace <clears throat> into this marriage, into the situation. It's what we're being called to do. Uh, and here's point three on, on how to third thing on how to care for our marriage. We make sure that we exercise our marriage through continued communication. And guys, it's a little harder for us. Let me explain. Har Harvard University did a study a couple decades ago where they were studying four-year-olds. They had hundreds and even thousands of four-year-olds that they monitored everything that the four-year-olds said over the course of a week. And here's what they found out. Four-year-old girls... 100% of everything that came out of their mouth was conversational. Four-year-old boys, 60% of what came out of their mouth was conversational. The other 40% was animal and machine noises. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. And, and, and what this tells us, guys, is that we start out behind women when it comes to communicating, and we never do quite catch up. But God is saying, I want you to try. I want you to be intentional about communicating. I, I want you to bring that in. You know, when I started in the ministry, and, and, and I, I'd go through a long, hard day, and, and some days would get really long and really hard, especially when I'm the, the solo pastor of a church, and then I'm, I'm preaching three times a week, and I've got all the hospitals, and I've got all the weddings, and all the funerals, and all the counseling, and everything that's going on. And, and, and I would come home after a long day, and my wife would want to talk about everything I've done. And, and I'm like, you know, I had to go through it once. I don't want to go through it again. You know, and I have to talk at work. I don't want to bring my work home with me, you know, kind of a thing. That just didn't work. I, I watched my marriage dry up. God says, husbands, be intentional about these things. Be intentional about caring for your marriage. Be intentional in these ways. Number four. And this is really a command to both of us. Be filled with the Spirit. And, and, and I'll explain this as we continue here in Ephesians 5. Verse 31, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Now, this is literally quoting from Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. And that's the passage I took last week. So if you weren't here last week, last week was part one, today is part two. So the precursor to today's message is last week, go online, listen to that, or go to the bookstore and grab one of those CDs if you want to pick up on that. So he says this in verse 32, this is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. So basically what we're being told here is this, the unity that God wants us to have in marriage is like the unity that Jesus has with his church. That unity is built on Jesus' love, Jesus' sacrifice, Jesus' empowerment. The unity that we have in our marriage is built on Jesus' love, Jesus' sacrifice, and Jesus' empowerment as well. We need all of that. We need to go back. You say, well, how can I be the first to bring forgiveness into the home because Jesus was the first? And guys, Jesus is not just the model that we follow, but his presence in our life as we trust in him, as we have his forgiveness and we are made new by him, he in us, Christ in us, gives us the power to be the first to forgive, gives us the power to be the first to reconcile. That's what we're being called to. You see, this unity that Christ has with us, it's, it's the same unity, he says, I want you to have with each other. I want it to be based on that, your marriages to have the same thing. Verse 33, and here Paul just kind of sums it up. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. 
So husbands, here's what we're being told. We're being told to ask ourselves these questions. Am I loving her with the same love that Christ has for me? Secondly, am I setting the pace in my marriage by being the first to bring grace into the family, into the marriage, into the situation, into the circumstance? Thirdly, am I sacrificing so that my wife might be all that Christ intends her to be? Is she now more radiant and more alive and more joyful as a result of being married to me? And if she isn't, then we've got some work to do. And that's what we're being told. Wives, here's what we're being to- you're being told here in this passage. Are you respecting your husband? I know a lot of women that really do deeply love their husbands. They just absolutely do not respect them. They will belittle their husband in public, I know, because I hear it, I see it quite often. Talk about their husband negatively. They will criticize him openly. They will speak down to him publicly. And in doing so, the husband literally backs off. Quits trying. It just creates yet another chasm. And the husband generally, and we see this lived out way too much, pours himself into a place where he can get some respect, and often that's work. And so we've got this cycle in marriages where there's this push and pull, there's this chasm between us so often because we aren't building the way God asks us to build. And here's the main point. We aren't loving each other the way Christ loves us. I mean, instead, we're, we're in it, we're pushing, we're in a, in a constant conflict, and we're not living out the marriage the way God wants us to live. So what do we do? Because we're all going to fall short. How do we make this happen? How do we make this work? How do we pull this off? Go back to Ephesians 5 verse 18 because this is the entry point into this entire passage on husbands and wives. It begins with verse 18. There is no disconnect. It flows directly. Verse 18 says this, don't be drunk on wine. Don't be drunk on alcohol, which leads to debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, why is Paul saying this? Here's what he's saying. Don't be under the influence of alcohol or anything else for that matter. Don't be under the influence of it. Don't find your strength from alcohol, your boldness from alcohol, your comfort from alcohol. Don't find your peace from alcohol. Find it from the Holy Spirit instead. Don't don't find what you need in chemicals. Find it in God. Don't be driven by chemicals. Be driven by God. And what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? It's the word pleru in Greek. Pleru means stretched almost, uh, almost to the point of bursting at the seams. Think of a sail ship that the sails are down and the sails are so full of wind that they are stretched almost to the point where they're bursting at the seams. Okay, this is the image that we have when it comes to being filled with the Spirit. Think of a ship on the ocean with the sails stretched to the full. But how do we get there? Well, here's how we get there. We've got to aim the ship in the right direction. You see, a lot of us are, well, I I want to do it my way. I'm going to aim my ship in the wrong direction. I'm going to unfurl the sails, and then we we just just get driven into the ocean. I mean, nothing good happens if you aim your sails, aim your ship in the wrong direction, and lower your sails. I mean, it just doesn't happen. We've got to aim in the right direction individually, and we've got to aim in the right direction as a marriage. How do we aim in the right direction as a marriage? Well, Ephesians 5 tells us. Genesis 2 tells us, where I talked about last week, here's how we aim in the right direction. Are you? Are you as an individual aiming your life in the right direction, in the direction of Christ? Are you you surrendered to Him? Are you repentant? Are you open? Are you emptying yourself so that He might fill you up? Have you given your life to Christ? Have you received His forgiveness so that you might extend it to others? Are you aiming your ship in the right direction? Are you aiming your marriage, if you're married, in the right direction? You you can't expect to be empowered by God if you're not. If you're not doing these things, you can't expect to be filled with the Spirit of God. But if you do these things, God says, I want to fill you up. I want to give you the strength to do everything that you've just been told to do. And great things will then happen. So what's the key? Well, we've got to, 
love each other with the same love Christ has for us. How do we get there? We have to be filled with the Spirit. We have to rely on Him and trust in Him. Are you doing this? In your marriage, are you doing this? Husbands, wives, those of you who hope to get married, are you this person who is looking to build in this way? Yeah, there's a lot of hurt, a lot of struggles, a lot of hurt in our marriages. I I think it's only appropriate that we end by praying for the marriages that are here and praying for you if you are about to enter into a marriage. And so if that's you, if you're married or about to be married, would you stand and, and let me and let us pray for you? Let's pray together that your ship would be aimed in the right direction, that you would ultimately unfurl those sails, empty yourself, be filled with the Spirit of God, and be propelled in His direction. Let's pray together. Father, right now, for those of us that are standing, Lord, Jesus, if we don't know You, none of this applies. It begins as we trust our life to You. As as we receive Your forgiveness, Your grace, and then You give us new life. You give us then the power to extend this forgiveness, to extend this grace. Jesus, if we don't know You, lead us to the cross. May, May we encounter what it really means to live really for you because you died for us. And Lord, for those of us that do, that do know you, strengthen our marriages. Uh, Father, forgive us as husbands if we have tried to dominate our wives in ways that God, you would never even dominate us. Forgive us as wives if, well, our disapproval and our criticism has crushed the spirit of our husbands. Forgive us for not treating each other and for the times that we haven't. Jesus, as you have treated us, forgive us so that we might be free to do just that, to treat each other as you have treated us. Lead us by your Spirit. Empower us. As we commit to applying this passage, empower our marriages. Pour into our homes. Guide our families. Heal whatever wounds we may have caused by trying to aim our ship in our own direction. Heal us. Put us on the right path and on the right track. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.